Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow coral plants. And today we're going to be talking all about planting fruit trees. And in this video, I've got seven helpful tips on steps you can take to maximize your success the next time you go to planting a tree, whether it be an ornamental tree, a rose. And in this situation, we've got a grapefruit um, tree, specifically, if you want to come in a little closer, um, of the Oro Blanco variety. And, and this here is in the tree form. Like we got a standard size tree. The goal is we want a plant that's gonna be 15 to 25 feet in height rather than a semi-standard tree, which on average may grow between eight to 15 feet. And a dwarf, which is the shortest of the varieties, can be anywhere from about three to six feet. Um, so again, check with the grower to find out what rootstock they use to graft that variety on because the same Oro Blanco grapefruit could also be a dwarf, a semi-dwarf, or a standard. And again, in this example, we're planting a standard tree to fit the area that we're going to be planting it within. Um, the tips, just to quickly recap, that we're going to discuss are here as follows. Um, we're going to talk about, and this is obvious, it shouldn't even be a tip, but the first one is grow something you like. And it wouldn't make sense to plant a tree and spend the years that it's going to take to get to fruit production only to not enjoy the fruit. Um, there's so many choices of plants out there. I would recommend that you um, join one of the best things I did this year was join what's called the Rare Fruit Growers of California. And just about in every city throughout, I'm aware of Southern California, I know they're also based in Northern California. Um, so I'm sure you can find one near you if you're in California. And I'm sure there's organizations all across the United States where you can find other people in your community that are growing really cool stuff. The stuff you will not find at your nursery and they're very generous people, at least the ones I've met here in Los Angeles, saying help yourself to all my fruit and you know vegetables and whatever I've got growing on my property to just help you better understand the things you can grow and the delicious things you can have on your property. Um, so it's been very informative, I've learned a lot and I'm hoping to start introducing more of those um, native, I take that back, not native, but exotic fruits, the thing from all around the world um, that could succeed in our growing zone that you would otherwise not find at a Home Depot Lowe's or even at your local nursery. So um, number one is grow something you like. The other tips quickly, and then I'm gonna go into them in more detail, is dig your hole wide and not, at, and not necessarily as deep. Um, native soil versus compost versus mixing those. Um, the fourth tip is talking about fertilizer. The fifth is watering. Six is support. And seven is protection from sun, insects, and rodents. Um, so to begin, we just talked about grow something you like. And here I've selected the Oral Blanco grapefruit variety. And if you take a look here at the label, it says grapefruit Oral Blanco. If we turn it over, it shows hardiness up to 30 degrees. Um, height. It says about 15 to 18 feet and again I'm assuming this is on the lower end I do expect it to be closer to 20 plus feet being that it's grafted onto a standard rootstock um, habit it's going to be rounded fertilized using an all-purpose fertilizer but we're going to discuss fertilization shortly and then watering it says weekly during dry spells so um, and we're going to talk about watering especially when you introduce a new plant into your ground so the first step Let's prepare the hole. So, we've just prepared the hole. As you can see, if, we, if you come in, what most of the directions are gonna say when it comes to preparing a hole is to make sure that it's no deeper than the container, but it's twice as wide. So we can still continue to go a little wider, and the theory and the um, concepts behind that so the reason is majority research, whether it's the majority, and I've seen even as much as 80% of the research will say that the, the most important roots will be in the top two to three feet of the surface. You would think a big giant tree needs to go down five, 10, 15, 20 feet or so, but that's not accurate. Check out those trees that topple over when there's a wind in your area or a storm that blows them over. And you'll notice that most of the roots are just right underneath the lawn if there is a lawn. And there's a reason behind that with you know, obviously when you're just watering the surface soil, the roots are gonna stay higher. But even with deep watering, your roots are still, the majority of them are gonna be in the top few feet. And hence it's important to improve the area around the plant more so than going as deep as possible. However, if you've got a situation with very thick, heavy clay soil, um, or, and I've lived in a place in Riverside where it was like completely solid rock, there may be additional benefit to go, 
you know, another foot or another two feet deeper to help get that root ball in the root zone a little deeper. But the reason most of the research, in my opinion, that they're saying not to go deep as much as they want you to go wide is because the compost we're going to be adding to the soil is going to disappear and allow the plant to settle some more and that can be far more damaging to your plant if the root ball sinks below ground level um, and for that reason we're going to plant the plant a little higher when we get to that point so here we are we prepared the soil you can see that we're probably a little bit below ground level we're probably going to lose an inch or two off the pot also once we clear the root ball so my first tip to you is to go wider than deeper that's your first tip so we just talked about plant what you like. Two, prepare your hole more wide and less deep. And the third tip we're gonna talk about now is, is improving the soil condition. So now we're gonna remove this and our native soil, as you can see, I mean, it's pretty good. And the amazing thing here as well, here as well is check out all of the organic material that's naturally in this soil. And this is something I've been working on for about the last three to four years. You can see it's still clay, so it clumps up like so. But there's a lot of organic material in the soil as well, but indicated by the um, darker soil that's in here. You see there's a roly-poly or, roly -poly or a saw bug, also known as a saw bug right there. Um, and check out some of these earthworms that are here in the soil. Let me pull this back. It's in here as well. Look at this. Check out this earthworm. This here's from the garden. So you can see that it's been eating very well. And we're going to talk about how these worms are growing and thriving to be as well as they are. And this is just one of about a dozen that I found as I was digging um, through this pile. So this here is the native soil. And what we're gonna do and what um, most growing instructions will say is to mix 50% of your native soil with a 50% compost. We're not talking about manure, we're talking about something that's a well-balanced compost, which you can get as an amend or a grow mulch from your nursery. And this here is one that I've purchased, as you can see here. So this here is, um, a compost that we can add to the um, soil as well as over here is one that I've made in my own garden and if you take a look in here you see that this is alive check out all of these worms look at this and look at that that's just amazing but it's not completely broken down look at how alive that is this is just amazing isn't it so as you can see here this material hasn't quite broken down all the way yet. There's still a lot of leaves in here. I've added some banana waste to this just a few weeks ago, um, which you can't see any evidence of banana. Here's some leaves um, or leaves that haven't broken down yet. Um, but this still needs to break down a lot more. If you put this at the bottom of the hole, since it hasn't quite broken down and composted, um, as they say, to the point that it's become brown, it's still considered green, even though it's not the color green, it just hasn't broken down all the way yet. So these worms are gonna continue eating it and turning it down into the elements, you know, with the waste that these worms are creating. So they're eating, creating waste, and that manure, once we water the, you know, and, and soak the plant in the root zone, all of those elements are gonna be readily available to the plants. So we're gonna use this more so as a top dressing and not put it at the base of the hole. So we're gonna keep this here on the side, and now we're just gonna improve the soil over here by adding some compost to the base, and we're gonna be adding some compost to the native soil around here, and we're gonna use this as our mix that's gonna go and ultimately backfill the soil area. So that's step three. So the next step is fertilizer. This is now my step number four, is fertilizer. I brought over here a whole bunch of organics, and I usually talk about how miracle Grow, the stuff that glows in the dark, you know, blue and red, Color miracle Grow are non-organic chemically made chemicals that bring nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium into your soil. But here are some organic solutions, even made by miracle Grow. And here's one um, that's a bone meal. And if we turn it over, it says on the back that it is a 680, which means 6% nitrogen, 8% phosphorus, and zero on the potassium. But we need potassium. When you install a brand new plant, we're gonna wanna make sure we got a lot of nitrogen so it can grow and potassium for healthy and strong disease resistant roots. Um, another alternative to making sure we've got just really good nitrogen is using something that's a, a, a blood meal. And here on the blood meal, we've got um, 1200, so 12% nitrogen and nothing else. And again, one of my philosophies when it comes to fertilizing is making sure you've got something that's balanced and has a lot of elements from the periodic table. Just doing nitrogen is not enough, so we're gonna wanna get a more balanced fertilizer. Here's another product made by Eco Scraps, and even though it's got a picture of a tomato, I like these numbers, five, four, six. 
more nitrogen, more potassium, and a little bit less phosphorus as we're not focused on flowers and fruit in the first year. The focus is all on growth. So this here is a, you know, a, poss a possibility. And then this one here is something that might be better in year two. This is here made by Dr. Earth, and it's a 394, 9% 9 on the phosphorus. So very high on flowers and fruit support. But again, that's less important to us in the first year. So we will not be using a product such as this, at least at the time of installation. And lastly, we've got another one, which is um, a balanced fertilizer, fish and kelp fertilizer. And on the back here, it says 222. So it's a balanced nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium fertilizer. The only drawback to this is you're gonna have to reapply it every two to four weeks, whereas the granular fertilizers below me will last at least two to three and possibly four months. So, and one of my methods as well is to visit your garden the first week of every month and feed it throughout the growing season. So we're talking about spring, summer, and fall feeding your plants that first week of every month with something, whether it be one of these fertilizers or an Epsom salt fertilizer, which I'll put a link down below um, to a video where we discussed that last year, um, as well as um, another important element for your garden is calcium, and I'll put a link to that one as well. So let's prepare the soil, and what we're gonna do just based on what I've brought with me today is I'm going to use Eco Scraps, which is a balanced five, four, six, and I'm also gonna add some blood meal as well, but I'm not gonna go crazy with the applications. By just adding compost, we've already got a lot of elements in the soil. This here is just to continuously feed those earthworms and the living organisms in your soil, which again, and I've said this many times, are your earthworms and your beneficial nematodes, your beneficial bacteria, and your beneficial micro um, rhiza fungi. So you've got all of this life in there, and that's what these organic materials are gonna do for your plants. Using a product such as this over here, so using a product such as this, which has citrus and avocado, is kind of misleading. It looks like, hey, this is gonna work great for my plants. But if you take a look here, you'll see that this is a chemically derived fertilizer. The organics are made from bone meal and blood meal and feather meal and kelp meal and fish meal. This is all derived from a factory with, you know, a chemically derived source for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So when you see a product that looks like this, think chemical, and this is not gonna feed your earthworms, it's not gonna feed your soil biology. Yes, the chemical stuff is not gonna feed your soil biology, which is ultimately gonna to lead to a more stable and healthy and longer lasting and living tree. So again, we said we're gonna use some eco scraps. I'm not looking at measuring out how many cups per height of fruit tree or anything. I'm just putting probably a quarter of a cup or less. I'm adding some to this soil as well, which is gonna get mixed in. And so this here is our eco scraps and we use such a small amount and then we're also gonna add the organic blood meal as well. And we can just go like that. And again, this here will feed the soil biology. We're just gonna mix this in and this is gonna be the soil we're gonna to use to backfill around the tree once we go to planting it. So this wrap around the tree, more likely than not, was put around it to protect the tree trunk from sun burn. So when you go to your nursery and you see a wrap like this, um, my theory is that it was on there to protect the plant and the tree trunk from sun damage, but we're gonna be talking about that towards the end of this video. But I'm gonna remove this protection. And next we're gonna remove these ties. When the nursery's got these in stock, right before the grower sells it to the nursery, they basically stake the trees and then they put on these very tight plastic ties around the tree. This is here just until the time of sale, but once you come home and install it, take it off. You need to resupport your tree as the bands are on so tight that it's actually constricting the flow of the waters and the sugars up and down the tree. And it'll stay like this for at least a year and sometimes several years and sometimes even grow into the tree if they're not removed. So we're gonna remove these bands and we're gonna remove the stake as well. So when we're removing the container, make sure that you kind of soften the tree around the, around the sides. And I like to simply hold the tree from the base and tap along the sides and it usually gives just like so. And the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is examine the root ball. And let's take a look here in, this, in the light. You can see it. These roots appear to be pretty dry even though we watered it yesterday. And you always wanna look at the base to see what's going on here. And you can see that these roots have 
grown into a mass, kind of like a bed. If we allow it to continue and these roots to continue growing upon one another, it risks potentially strangling one another and causing damage to the tree. It's very important that we try to break this down because we don't know how long this plant has been in the container. So we're just gonna open that all up. And if these roots don't let go of one another, you can actually even go with your pruners and prune them apart. But I can feel that they're really tied into one another, especially right here in the middle. So I'm really pulling that apart. The goal is I want these roots to grow out deep and wide and not tangled into one another. So here we are, we're opening that all up and then we can wake up the side as well by just running our fingers through it so that when the roots come into contact with the native as well as the compost soil, it's, wanna grow, it's gonna wanna grow out. And that's it, we're not gonna disturb it more than that. And this here is a pretty good wake up call to the to this grapefruit tree. Then we're gonna position it in the direction we want it. We're gonna set it down like so. We're gonna to wanna to make sure that the top of the root ball, and this is a very, very, very important step. And this is the reason I believe a lot of growers stop saying planting, your, um, digging a hole twice as deep and instead just go as deep as the container is because people make the mistake of planting their trees too deep and that causes a lot of damage, stunts the growth, and sometimes even kills your tree if the soil ends up going up the stem and causing what's known as stem rot. And that can actually um, damage and kill it and shorten the life of your tree. So I'm just removing the soil around the top soil because sometimes even the nursery growers will put too much soil around the top. But you can see right here is the surface soil as we're coming a little closer. Here's the first main root. And back here is the second main root. This here should be very close to the surface of the soil and no more than maybe a quarter inch below the surface. So we're gonna try to gauge that as we backfill the soil. And again, I wanna make sure the position of the tree is where I want it. And we're now gonna come back with the native as well as the compost soil and start backfilling around the tree like so. An important step while backfilling the soil is to make sure that you remove any air pockets. So I typically go in with my hands and I'll start putting a little bit of pressure, not too much and not too little, but just trying to um, make sure that the soil is in contact with the roots and that there aren't any gaps where the um, roots could be exposed to air pockets where they'll dry out if they're not in contact. So we're gonna cover that up carefully like so. And now the next step is, we're gonna to wanna to create a berm. This is gonna be something that's gonna collect the water when we soak the tree, which is ever more important, especially when getting it established in the first few months. So we're gonna make a berm around it to help retain the water and retain the fertilizers and all the good things that we're gonna put around it. So we're gonna do that like so right now. And there we go. And then in regards to the compost that we showed you before with all of the worms, let's see if they're still in here. For demonstration purposes, you can see that again. And again, this hasn't composted all the way down. You can see here, this here is part of the banana that was introduced a couple weeks ago that they're going in into and consuming. But what we're gonna do to prevent rotting from happening and near the base or even within the soil is we can use this as a top dressing around the edge, like so. Check out all of these worms, coming a little closer. This is crazy. I don't think I've ever seen so many worms on my compost bin as we do here now at the, um, in the middle of May. Check those out. On the same theme as fertilizer is I'm gonna put in also mulch. Um, it's important also mulch around your plants as this too, as it breaks down is gonna be um, returning a lot of nutrients and elements into the soil in addition to helping the plant retain moisture. Uh, so this is an important step to maximizing your plant's health. Additionally, it also will help fight and combat and prevent root rot. What wood chips will do is it help introduce a lot more beneficial organisms into the soil. They have also been proven to fight and prevent root rot around both your citrus as well as your avocados. Um, and I'm sure the same benefits apply to all of your other plants. But there's one tip when applying it. Let's go around the tree. And when planting your wood chips, make sure that you keep a distance from the wood chips away from the trunk of the tree. And in this example, we're gonna leave at least a couple of inches. And what this is gonna do is just help keep a nice, moist, 
habitat for all of the soil organisms to enjoy living right underneath the wood chip. So it's gonna help you know, keep it cooler and more moist, but at the same time help introduce so many more beneficial organisms to help protect and maintain the life of the tree. As a bonus, and this is kind of outside, but it kind of falls under fertilizer, if you've got a spent bouquet of flowers around your house, um, don't throw them away. Your plants and your trees can benefit from them. And check out how over here. Um, in between my two citrus trees, and the same concept applies everywhere throughout my garden, between my bananas, avocados, my figs, pomegranates, Throughout the garden, there is these piles, and what these piles will have are all the cuttings from around the garden, grass clippings. Um, if you come in a little deeper, you can see over here that we've got some of the banana peels, you know, that we've enjoyed. And if you, um, if we had a little more light, you might be able to see, I'm gonna pull this up. You can actually see the slime from the um, slugs and the snails that were climbing all over it and breaking this material down. And when we go to water this, and again, we'll put this bouquet right on top, but when you go to watering this, all of that manure coming from all of those organisms that are breaking it down is going right back in the soil and benefiting the trees on each side. So if you've got room between your trees, this is an important consideration is to add compost piles between your trees. So now we're on step five, and that's watering. When you go to watering your plant, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you soak the entire root zone. So, we're going to so here we are now at the middle or end of May and the weather's starting to warm up. Our days here in Los Angeles are now in the mid 70s and mid 80s and you know June's upon us and I'm sure we're gonna start having some 90s and I'm sure some possible 100s within the next 60 to 90 days. So during the first month, it's important to water your tree probably every other day for the first couple of weeks. But make sure when you water it, you're soaking it. Look at how much water we're putting around the tree. And again, we created that berm to make sure that water stays around the plant. What's eventually gonna happen as the tree matures is this berm is gonna, um, we're gonna break it back down and it's gonna be level with the rest of the garden. So whatever you see that's created as a berm and it looks like it's underwater and it's below soil level is in fact not true. We're gonna end up breaking this berm down or it's naturally gonna break down over time between the weather and as the compost breaks down around it and all these additional wood chips that are already here and it's gonna be close to the soil level naturally. And when watering it, imagine you gotta water your tree at least two, three feet, four feet deep. You're gonna to wanna to encourage those roots to, roots to get down as deep as possible. And that's the importance of watering deep as we're doing here today. This process will take at least five, possibly 10 minutes. And another idea is to run your water on slow and just allow it soak over the next 30 to 60 minutes. So another concept is to actually have a sprinkler as I've done over here. This here is my concept of a drip irrigation. It's pretty much dropping the water around the base of the tree, soaking the root ball, and again, being that this is a newly installed tree, as well as if there's any risk of gopher or moles or voles or anything that may be living underneath the ground, you may from time to time need to stick your hand in around the root zone to make sure you collapse any holes as that's another thing that can divert the water that's around your plant and take it to another zone. So again, when it comes to watering, make sure you soak it. Again, when it comes to initial plantings, probably water every other day for the first couple of weeks. Through the spring, on average, I water once a week um, and maybe once every 10 days. And again, this is for a more established tree. When it's the summer, it's probably once a week heavy watering, maybe intense heats, once every five days. And um, and again, back in the fall, you treat it just like you would in the spring. Watering's once a week, once every 10 days. In the winter, most of my trees go without water as long as it's raining at least once or twice a month. Your potted plants require much more water because their roots are in that pot. And again, it doesn't have the soil moisture that it can rely on between watering. So it's gonna require a lot more monitoring if you've got your plants in pots and containers instead of in ground. Pause. So my next tip, let's just recap real quick what we've done. We've talked about plant something you'll enjoy and like eating. Two, dig your hole wide, more so important than digging deep. Three, we talked about the importance of mixing your native soil with compost at a rate of about 50% each. And we also then four added some fertilizer, organic fertilizers to feed the soil biology. Five, we talked about watering. 
six, which is the step we're on right now, support. When it comes to supporting your plants, this was the stake that the tree came with, which you can recycle and reuse. I'm electing to use this stake, which is a green stake, and it's actually a metal stake that's covered in a vinyl wrap. And if you use just a metal stake alone, the heat from the stake can actually burn your plant that comes into contact with the stake. So be careful using just a metal stake alone in your garden if you've got any metal stakes out there. But use something like this, this is my preference, or even a wooden stake. Equally good choice, I'm just doing this for cosmetics. So here we go, we're gonna now put a stake to support the tree like so. I'm just gonna push that in the ground. And the goal with the stake is we're gonna have many days this week, we're gonna have winds that are gonna be blowing through here at 30, 40, 50, 60 miles, and I don't want this tree to go through the stress and the shock of all of that. Um, so what the stake's gonna do is to make sure that it stays within an allowable zone of being blown around, but I don't want it to necessarily topple over. The other thing too is the stake's gonna provide support between now and probably the next three years, and not more than that. As the plant continues to grow, we're gonna continue pruning it down. Right next to it, this tree you know, is measuring probably about three feet on me, but right behind me is a bear's lime tree that was the same height last year, and you can see that it has since grown more than double the height. This here is another standard variety of what's called the bear's lime or the Tahitian lime, same, same, same fruit. And, and the goal is we're creating these tree-shaped um, plants within the garden all, and again, here's the avocado tree that's behind me, all of them that we're gonna to try to manage between 15 and 25 feet. So you're gonna to get to watch that over the years with me. So here's our bear's lime tree, and over here we've got our Oro Blanco grapefruit tree. So our goal is as the plant continues to grow, that we're gonna manage the height, and we're gonna make sure that the trunk and the lower branches to support all of the weight and all the branches that are above. Initially, we're gonna use a stake, but eventually, once this trunk and the lower branches get strong enough, and with the pruned branches that we're gonna make sure are light enough to support on those lower trunks and branches, then we can remove the stake. So it's a process that'll take about three years. So in the meantime, this stake is gonna provide that support. When it comes to tying on your support, we're just gonna go here with our twine. And again, no matter what you're tying, whether it be um, your vertical tomatoes in your garden, or in this example, we're doing a tree, you always wanna make sure that your tie is on the supporting stake and not against the plant, because you don't wanna constrict the growth with the knot against the tree. So we are supporting it against the stake, and then we're gonna wrap around the tree like so. And this here is gonna allow it to move some we're not holding it perfectly in position so that it does develop its own strength as it does you know, get blown around a little bit in the wind, but we're controlling how much it moves by doing this. There we go. Now we'll just tie off the excess string and now our tree's supported. So here we are now, it's close to noon. If you take a look, the sun is basically, you know, casting its sun upon the top shading all of the lower structure, the branches and tree trunks, but within the next hour or two, the sun's position is gonna move and all of that light is gonna be against the tree trunk and lower branches. So the next step is, is called protecting. Protect your plant from damaging sunburn in the summer, damaging sun scald in the winter, which is when the nighttime low temperatures are so cold, followed by afternoon temperatures that move the saps. Um, protecting it, and it's a, it's a phenomenon known as whitewashing. And most people apply the concept of whitewashing to protect your trees from winter damage. And the vessels which are moving and transporting the waters and sugars up and down the plant um, are susceptible to damage, just like the pipes in your house on a cold, freezing winter night have the risk of rupturing. The same thing can happen within your plant. And whitewashing helps prevent it. Instead of using paint, there's Ivy Organic, which is a three-in-one plant guard. It's protection against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents for use on your roses, um, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. And the difference between this product and paint is it's non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic product. Comes in colors green. Over here is color brown. And then you've got also color white. And the white is registered material for use in organic agriculture. The other colors are still pending certification. And we've also got next to it, which we're gonna discuss shortly, is Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guards um, a ready to use spray on. Um, and we're gonna talk about how we're gonna use that as well. So the first thing we're gonna do is coat the branches. And if you take a look at all of these pruned branches, historically, these are all exposed wood. If I can go with my, um, 
screwdriver here, you can see right on the tip of my screwdriver, this is all exposed wood. The cambium tissues are still expanding, the bark is still expanding and will eventually close the wound as it has done on this side. This here was a wound that has since closed up, but this one's still exposed. And if you take a look at the graft mark right there, this here was the original rootstock that was grafted on a standard rootstock. This here is the Oro Blanco variety of grapefruit that was grafted onto the rootstock. But this here, which was the main plant that was the rootstock that was pruned to encourage the growth to go into the scion wood or the selected wood, um, has, is still exposed right there. And that here will be coated as well with the ivory organics to prevent any wood boring insects from getting into the heart of the tree and hollowing out and damaging the plant before it even has a good start. So the next thing we need to do is, is coat it. I've already got this can ready for use and I was using this for my other trees and if you take a look it has since dried out a little bit. It's kind of turned into a paste which is an option as well depending on how much water you add but we're going to want to use this as a paint so I'm going to dilute this a little further with some more water by just adding some more water to it. But this was used as a brush on about a week ago on some other trees in the garden and now we're more at the consistency of what the directions require which is about a 50% um, you know, dilute, diluted paint is what it's supposed to look like, which is where we're at right now. We'll then take our brush here and we're going to start coating the tree like so. And again, all the exposed surfaces will be um, coated and it's important again to get all of the trunk and the lower branches that may be exposed to too much light. Again, the goal is to protect it from sunburn damage as here we are at the end of um, May and we're just going to get into hotter months and it's going to be helpful to keep this plant cooler so it can focus more on growing rather than repairing damaged tissues caused by sunburn. And there we go. We're gonna to wanna to go as low as we can go so you can also, you know, as well. And that'll help prevent any risk of girdling, which is caused by many of the soil rodents, which includes rats and mice and gophers and moles or voles. I know one of them's also um, potentially at risk for damaging your fruit trees um, when they're hungry enough to gnaw on a tree to get the sugars um, from the plant. So this here, um, will protect the plant and the way it does so is it's the castor oil that's in the product. If you take a look, the first ingredient here is castor oil. It also has cinnamon oil, clove oil, cedarwood oil, garlic oil, peppermint oil, and rosemary oil. All of these oils help defend the plant, not just against rodents, but predominantly also um, any insects from getting into the plant. While we're in the process of protecting the plant, and here comes the sun again, shining bright and, and hard on the leaves of the plant, Again, this is newly installed, and one of the things that hurts plants at the beginning is sun stress. And what this product will now do is, is keep the plant cool at the foliar level. So what we're going to do now is spray the leaves, like so. And what we've got here is an organic sunblock with the seven natural oils to, one, help keep the plant cool, so it can focus more so on getting established and off to some good growth. And if you zoom in here, you can actually see some of the light white foliar spray that are here on the leaves. And what this will also do is ensure that the leaves stay. And a lot of people have already reported that these coated leaves are far less susceptible to being eaten by, it's especially grasshoppers, um, as well as a lot of caterpillars, you know, that might be chewing on the leaves. And the risk is, a, is significantly less being that it's protected by those seven oils. So if you found this video informative, be sure to like it. And most importantly, by subscribing below, you'll be connected to all of these educational gardening videos. But this time, I'm going to bring special thanks to um, two other individuals. The first one being Coach Green from Healthy Homestead Living. I'm going to try to post a video right here in the upper corner um, where you'll see her use and the way she uses Ivory Organics in her garden. And um, we also have a YouTube video that was prepared by Joey and Holly Baird of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden. And both of these people that I just mentioned um, have their own YouTube channels, they have their own um, websites, and additionally, um, Joey and Holly of the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden have a radio show that's hosting every Saturday morning. So be sure to check them out and check out their website and subscribe to them. And so just trying to put you in touch with two other remarkable YouTube channels 
Um, Joey and Holly with the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener, Gardeners have over 800 YouTube videos. I don't know how they do it, but they've got 800 videos talking about all the details of gardening. Um, and then they have a gardening show and they have an um, excellent forum for question and answers as well. Um, and if you visit Coach Green, she has a lot of tips on healthy living and a lot of healthy recipes, as well as some gardening tips there. So I hope you enjoy those. Those are my recommendations to you this week. And again, don't forget, if you haven't already, subscribe to the Ivory Organics Gardening channel. Thanks again for watching. Happy gardening.